All right, it's 3.01. We have 60 people and more are filtering in. We had over 250 people uh, sign up, um, but we have a full hour ahead of us. And so we'd like to get started so that we can make the most of our time and leave enough time at the end for questions. So welcome everybody. Hello, and thanks for joining us. My name is Max Bookman. I'm an attorney. I'm a, a partner at the firm Pazetsky and Bookman. With me is my father and partner, Robert Bookman. Uh, we are general and legislative counsel to the Hospitality Alliance, and this program is being made possible by the Hospitality Alliance. It's going to be a one-hour program, and we're going to be doing it in two parts. Part one is going to be talking about uh, alcohol, and part two is going to be about cannabis. There is a Q&A function at the bottom of everybody's screen. Um, feel free, and we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A. We will address questions at the end. We'll also potentially address questions um, throughout if, it, if there's a particular question that we think is appropriate and on point for us to address at a, at a particular moment. Um, but yes, please use the Q&A function. Don't use the, the chat. Uh, we won't be looking at the chat. We will be looking at the Q&A. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Hello, everybody. Uh... Nice to beginning together um, for this nice substantive uh, discussion. Uh, we have a lot to cover in one hour, so uh, just a broad, you know, procedural uh, and substantive introduction. Um, so, first, a little bit about the alliance. For those of you who don't know, you know, about the Hospitality Alliance, it's uh, we just had our tenth anniversary. It is the largest and most important. Uh, Hospitality Trade Association uh, in the country, most likely, based on you know, we have 2,000 establishment members. We are very active uh, in the city and the state, and COVID forced us to get involved with the federal government as well. If you're not a member of the Hospitality Alliance, you should be. Um, and you can go onto their website and join up. It's not expensive, but it is the premier organization. We are your voice in the halls of government. Uh, on every issue that you could possibly imagine that impacts um, your, you know, your business and this industry. Also, a little bit about who we are. For those of you who only know us as counsel to the Hospitality Alliance, our firm, Pazetsky & Bookman, has been around for over 33 years now. Um, we are beverage uh, alcohol control uh, experts. That's what we do. Um, the SLA is the main agency that we practice before, but we also, my background is from city government. We also are involved with city agencies dealing with a variety of issues relating to your industry. I'm on the health department advisory board. Um, I was on the nightlife advisory board, uh, sidewalk cafes, which used to be consumer affairs. We've been involved with, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. It's probably uh, likely that we have filed more applications at the State Liquor Authority in the last 33 years than any other law firm practicing in this area today. So this is what we do, and we're going to be giving you the benefit of the latest of what's going on uh, you know, with the ABC law, with the SLA uh, you know, on this seminar, as well as getting, you know, getting into cannabis as well. Uh, as far as alcohol goes, the main issues right now at the State Liquor Authority is processing time. It's taking seven to eight months after the community board to get a new application approved. Uh, because of our efforts, uh, you know, and the alliance's efforts, there are a variety of potential temporary permits that are that are available now, which weren't available in New York City historically. Um, I do want to say that the liquor authority understands that this is an unacceptable length of time. Um, it's really historic, um, and they are doing whatever they can to address it. Uh, partly with our support, they gained 30 new positions just for licensing uh, review. Uh, as many of you know, and as many of you have experienced, it's hard to fill positions, and they're having a hard time filling positions. So I think they got about half of them filled. They still have to be trained. Um, but you know, they, they are uh, doing a variety of things, some of which we will discuss today, to try to reduce that time frame and to try to make application process you know, a little bit simpler. As to cannabis, same issue. Slow speed, uh, still the main issue on the cannabis side right now. Applications are still not open for uh, regular business people that are not part of the Heward program. Um, they also, uh, they're well-known challenges in the rollout. Uh, it's been slow. It's been well-publicized, these problems. There have been lawsuits that are pending. Uh, one lawsuit's been successful. Others have recently been filed. 
uh, challenging the, you know, the entire regulatory structure uh, that they've established. Um, today, we'll cover the status of the program from a hospitality perspective, uh, because this is really a hospitality lines event. So we will get into cannabis from a hospitality industry perspective as well. Max? All right. And with that, we are off to the races. So talking about alcohol first, the first update we want to give you is on temporary retail permits. Um, I'm going to, and this is under the heading of recent and proposed legislative changes. And so right now it's the legislative session. Uh, the state legislature is in session right now. They're doing the budget. They're going to be in session until June. And so now is the time of the year where there's a number of uh, changes in the law that are proposed. 2022 was a big year for changes in the alcohol law as well. Of course, in New York state, alcohol is regulated at the state level. And so the legis any changes that are going to happen that relate to alcohol are really going to happen at the state level. Um, and there's been a lot going on with temporary retail permits, both in 20, you know, in, in 2022, in the past, and looking ahead to the future. And so we want to bring you up to speed on all of that. And we encourage you to ask any questions that you may have about it, because we, in our practice, we field a lot of questions about temporary retail permits. So a temporary retail permit, for those who don't know, it allows an applicant to operate serving alcoholic beverages under the privileges of the license that they've applied for, while that license application is pending. And so if you are eligible for a temporary retail permit, it's of great value to you given the lengthy processing times. Rob mentioned that at the top, and that's going to be a recurring theme that you hear uh, throughout today is that there's a lot of processing time issues out there. And so there's a number of solutions that are being proposed to try to deal with the impact of those lengthy processing times. And temporary retail permits is a good way to address that because while it may take seven to eight months for a permanent liquor license to be issued, um, if you are eligible for a temporary retail permit in the meantime, um, that's helpful to you because you can begin to sell alcoholic beverages. So where we were previously before recent changes in the temp permits law was that New York City was really treated differently than the rest of the state in a really bad way. Outside of New York City, historically, if you were applying for a liquor license, you got to have a temp. That was pretty much period, end of story. Within New York City, the situation was, the default was you could not get a temp. The only exception to that in New York City was that if you were buying somebody else's business, buying the assets of somebody else's business, a lot of folks refer to that as a, a transfer, even though liquor licenses aren't actually transferred. That's what people would call it. You're purchasing the assets of an existing business. During COVID, that was increasingly less frequent because given all of the businesses that went out of business and all the vacant storefronts, there weren't a lot of businesses to purchase. And there wasn't really the same incentive to purchase a business when there were so many just empty storefronts, you could really have your pick. And so there really needed to be a change in the law to help bring parity to New York City. We with the Hospitality Alliance, we ad advocated our best for, for pure parity because we don't believe in in differences in a statewide law that carve out you know New York City and treat New York City differently than the rest of of the state for negative treatment um it's not quite what we got but we got a, a good start so the current law in effect that we were 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 major players in advocating for is if you're in New York City and it's a beer and wine license application you're applying for beer and wine you get to have a, a temp that's great if it's a full liquor license application, it depends on whether you're subject to the 500 foot law or not. Um, we have a variety of people on this call from a variety of backgrounds and a variety of levels of experience. So some of you know this already, but just very briefly, 500 foot law, it's an oversaturation law. Different sorts of legal consequences attach to your application if your application is subject to the 500 foot law. If there are three or more full liquor licenses within 500 feet of your full liquor license application, you're subject to the 500 foot law. As it relates to temps, it, under the new law that we got passed, if your application is not subject to the 500 foot law, which is pretty rare in most parts of New York City, then you also get to have a temp just as if you were applying for a beer and wine license. You get a even if you know you get a temp just just the same. If you are subject to the 500 foot law, which is most of New York City, um, then you can only get a temp under certain conditions. Um, two most primarily are number one, 
if the premises has been licensed in the past two years. And the other condition is that you only get to have the temp after the state liquor authority has held a 500 foot hearing, which could take several months. Um, and even only then your, your, your temp is limited to certain um, default hours of operation uh, and other limitations, midnight closing hours, closing early or outside, uh, no DJ, no dancing, et cetera. So that's the current lay of the land. And that's what we've been operating under for the past uh, year or so. Um, what we are hoping to see done and we as the Hospitality Alliance are advocating for in 2023 is to build on that success. The temp law has been successful. It's allowed businesses, new businesses in New York City to get open faster, just like everyone else can outside of New York City, um, without having to suffer the currently you know, seven to eight month processing times. So we want to open up eligibility. So we've uh, proposed two changes to the law. Number one, we want to eliminate the two-year limitation, that two-year look back. Um, the two years was, was brought into effect uh, last year when COVID was two years old. So the idea was there was a lot of businesses that went out of business only two years ago, but now COVID is three years old and there's still vacant storefronts. So if you have a business that went out of business in 2020 and now you're coming in to replace them, well, 2020 is now more than two years ago. So you're not eligible for a temp if you want a full liquor license and it's a 500 foot law case. Um, so we want to eliminate that completely. It really prejudices new construction, Moynihan Train Hall is a perfect example of that, but there's other major construction projects throughout New York City as well, where if it's new construction, obviously there hasn't been a liquor license in the last two years, so you're not eligible for a temp. That's Grand, Cent Grand Central Madison, another example. And, and private projects as well, big hotels, uh, small projects too, if it's just a new building that's gone up. Um, so uh, we want to see that eliminated. And the other thing we want to see eliminated is the requirement that you have to wait for a 500 foot hearing to be held in order for you to get your temp. Um, the vast majority of applications come to the Liquor Authority with the support of the community board um, and are not controversial. In, in, when, it's, when an application is in that posture, um, almost always is it almost always follows that the 500 foot hearing results in a positive recommendation for the applicant. And so this requirement that you have to wait for something that we all know what the result is going to be, which is if you have community boards approval and your application is not controversial, you're going to get approved by the 500 foot hearing to have to wait for that, which could sometimes take months. Um, really is you know is a waste of time where you could be operating under your your temp so and we're again, and since and since very few out locations outside of new york city fall under the 500 foot law it's particularly prejudicial for new york city it has a discriminatory impact and as i've said now is is the legislative session now is the time where where changes are being made so we are one voice in the conversation uh, anyone who's listening who feels particularly motivated by this issue should add their voice to the conversation. But you should understand that there are other voices as well that have different ideas. And so, you know, the governor has put forth uh, their proposal as part of their executive budget. They've not adopted what we've been recommending. They've uh, they have recommended getting rid of the uh, the two year limit. So we we do support that. That that aligns with what we we've asked for as well. But they haven't gone so far as 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 putting forth a uh, removing the 500 foot law, you know, waiting for the hearing to happen limitation. So you know it's half the way there, and it's great that that you know they went that far. But you know we obviously as an industry would like to see them go a little further. Max, just mention what are the current. Uh... Temp waiting times, you know, so they get an idea of how beneficial it really is. Yeah, so that is an issue. It's a good point. So um, if you are eligible for what we in our office call a quick temp, which is, you know, a, a beer and wine license, for example, you don't have to wait for the 500 foot hearing. You can get that currently around a month, maybe even a less, a little bit less than a month after you file. We've seen some cases where it's been as quickly as three weeks. Uh, and that, that time frame is getting better. But by contrast, if you have to, if you're only eligible for one of these, what we call slow temps, which is one of these temps where you have to wait for the 500 foot hearing, initially it was taking upwards of three and a half months from when you have when you file. The liquor authority, to their credit, has implemented some internal processes to try to cut that down, but it could still take as long as two months to get your temp. And so we're talking about a month plus difference between, uh, you know, when you have to wait for the 500 foot hearing or not. 
Um, and that's a real difference in the life, as people on this call know, that's the real, it's a real difference in the life of a small business that needs to, that's probably already paying rent, that's looking to get open, that needs their temp as soon as humanly possible. Um, so the that, that's the governor's proposal. The state assembly and, and the Senate have, have not adopted any, either of these ideas. And so their current proposals don't include any of what we're talking about. They, you know, they, they're not proposing any sort of changes that would uh, get rid of the two years or get rid of the 500 foot. Um, you know, that's in their budget. Um, obviously, when the budget is done, um, there'll be time to talk more. But, you know, uh, it's a part time legislature we have. They're only, you know, uh, do you know, open only open for business uh, for lawmaking until June, and so um, you know it's it's a pretty truncated period of time, and so that's the current status of the temp law. We got some changes done, um, but there's there's room for improvement. Rob, anything you want to say before we switch gears? I just want to mention that the legislature is still focused on the budget right now, which is supposed to be due April first, which everybody's read is not going to be April first. Um, so it's not that they are opposing our proposals here. It's just that they're saying they're not ready to discuss those proposals with us until after the budget's done, when there's approximately then, you know, two months left of the legislative session, when there's a rush to get all the substantive laws done. So we, we haven't given up. <laughs> all right, next is outdoor dining. And that's on you, Rob. That's on me. I was just trying to answer a, uh, <laughs> I was answering a, a question on the, on the question and answer. So yes, um, recap where we are again on outdoor dining is a good start. And we're not going to do an entire discussion of the outdoor dining law because we're just trying to, you know, keep it somewhat limited, but it's so related. As you all know, prior to COVID, uh, we had a sidewalk cafe law at the Department of Cons that was handled by the Department of Consumer Affairs. It had been in effect since 1980. Um, it was a long process. Uh, it took many months, about six months to get approved. Every four years, you had to do a long renewal. It was expensive. Uh, there was zoning restrictions on where a cafe could go. And as a result of all of that, there were only about 1,200 licensed sidewalk cafes in all of New York City, and almost all of them were south of 96th Street in Manhattan. Uh, I don't think, I think there was zero in Staten Island. Um, when COVID came and we were all shut down in March of 2020, the Alliance jumped on this issue immediately and we said, hey, you know what? It could well be that we'll discover pretty soon that being outdoors is not as dangerous as being indoors. Uh, and why don't we create some emergency programs so all these restaurants could have some seating outdoors? Um, Obviously, we were correct with that. Uh, we were we were ahead of ourselves on the science. It still took a couple of months during the emergency, but by June, around mid June, the emergency outdoor dining program came into effect. Um, and as a result of that, was where there were twelve hundred, you know, licensed sidewalk cafes. There were about twelve thousand uh, uh, establishments throughout the city. Very democratic. Every borough, every neighborhood uh, had outdoor dining. Um, that emergency program still exists today, three years later. It's coming to an end uh, for, for obvious reasons. There's no longer an emergency, um, and uh, we need a, a permanent program. Uh, we are extremely involved in the light, in the negotiation of that permanent program. Um, it's going to have to be done in the next month or two because there is a lawsuit pending saying since there's no more emergency health plan, pro, you know, uh, you know, orders, there shouldn't be an emergency outdoor order either. Um, and the judge is sympathetic to that. So I think the judge wants to see a permanent program. So we're going to see a permanent program, we hope. Uh, but the good news is it will include all year round outdoor dining on sidewalks. Uh, I've been around long enough to know that sidewalk cafes were seasonal once a period of time, once upon a time. You'll be able to be all year round on the sidewalk cafes. The roadside uh, might be seasonal, um, but that, that's an additional seating. Uh, in addition to that, the, the application process will be faster. There'll be temps, which there never was. It'll be less expensive than it ever was. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, we think it's going to be you know a, a much better program. And we got the zoning laws changed during COVID uh, so that there is, don't have these geographical restrictions. So it'll be much more democratic and available you know, throughout, throughout the uh, uh, neighborhoods in the five boroughs. We were, as a result during COVID, able to get certain laws um, 
change on the state level to allow alcohol in these emergency programs because while the city allowed us to use their space the state ne needed to coordinate and so we were involved in the coordinator of that as well and we got a law passed and you know which originally sunset but then we got it extended to 2025 saying that um, if you approved under the emergency program, you can have alcohol in your in your outdoor seating without going through this long formal uh, alteration application process with the state liquor authority. And that included roadside as well as, as sidewalk. So that law is still into effect in 2025. Once we get a permanent sidewalk cafe program, we'll probably have to go back to the state and make sure you know it's all coordinated, bike lanes and everything else you know is all properly considered. Um, so that's where we are at, you know, with outdoor dining. If anybody has a further question on that, they could put that in the Q and A's. For those people who came in late, we said if you have questions, put it in the Q and A's, and we'll try to get to it before the hour's over. Just one more note on the outdoor dining under that that state law that we got passed that's now in effect till 2025. There is some filing that you have to make with the state liquor authority, but it's it's an expedited filing. It's not a full fledged alteration application. It's if you it's on the SLA's website. If you read about it, it's basically just an email that you have to send to the SLA, and that that's important for anyone on uh, this call who has a restaurant, has outdoor dining in their restaurant, make sure that you have sent that email to the SLA to let them know that you're having alcohol in that outdoor dining area because some folks have uh, have missed that. And you have to show them that, you, you know, your approval, you know, from the uh, city. Yeah, that's right. Um, before we move on to the next topic, I just, you know, very quickly back on temps for a minute because someone asked a question in the q and I'd like to address right now, which is, um, uh, can you uh, can you file for a temporary license in advance of being open for business? What is the requirement to apply a signed lease? So most people apply for a temporary license before they're open for business, but you only apply for your temporary license when you apply for your permanent license. In other words, you can't just apply for a temporary license on its own. It has to be connected to a pending application or an application you're filing at the same time for a permanent license. So the second half, half of your question, which is, you know, do you need a signed lease? You do not need a signed lease in order to apply for a liquor license, including a, a temporary license. But you do need, if you don't have a signed lease, you, you do need a binding letter of intent. Um, well, if, I, if other folks have questions on outdoor dining, excuse me, on, um, on temp permits, we'll address that um, at the end. Um, and I do see some questions coming in about outdoor dining as well. Uh, Just right, quickly, somebody's wondering if you can apply for outdoor dining if you're opening a new restaurant or is it just locations that were previously open that can have it? No, new restaurants are still can apply under the emergency program. Uh, that's the program that exists until a new permanent law you know, is adopted. So uh, by all means, you know, and we've done many applications for outdoor dining under the emergency program for restaurants that did not exist when COVID started. And is there a date for the end of the emergency outdoor dining? Not, not yet. Um, but, you know, we're worried that it could be sooner rather than later, which is why we're pushing to get a permanent new law passed. I also want to mention, I'm just seeing some of the questions in the Q&A. If you have a very specific question that's unique, a unique fact pattern to your circumstances, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. It's easy to find us. Um, we're not necessarily going to address very specific, uh, fact-specific questions on here. We're going to try to keep it uh, general so that... Um, it's beneficial to everybody, but we're always happy to talk um, afterwards. And new, uh, by the way, new rules for cafes come out after the new law is passed. First, the law gets passed, then rules and regulations get passed. So we're even if a new law is passed in the next two, three months, um, you know, you're probably another couple of months after that, you know, for for particular regulations. So we're probably a good half a year away. Um. All right. So switching gears to alcohol to go, as I've said, we'll, you know, we'll leave some time at the end to circle back on additional questions if anybody has it on the outdoor dining topic. Um, all right. Alcohol to go was one of the major victories of 2022. And so we want to recap that for you briefly and then go over very quickly the 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 rules of alcohol to go because we get a lot of questions from people about alcohol to go and there's a lot of confusion out there about what's currently allowed versus what used to be allowed and it's important to get it right so of course before covid alcohol to go was generally not a thing a little known fact that that some people knew some businesses knew but a lot didn't know was that even before COVID, if you had an on-premises liquor license, so that's a, a license for a tavern, for a restaurant, for a hotel, you were allowed to sell beer 
and anything that falls under the category of beer, so that includes cider, um, to go as long as it was sealed. Um, no food requirement. That was always a privilege. And that remains a privilege to today. So fast forward to today, same rule. If you have an on-premises liquor license, you could sell beer to go as long as it is, is sealed. Um, no food requirement associated with it. Um, wine and, and spirits to go was never a thing. It was hardly ever even contemplated. Um, when COVID happened, there was an executive order, which everybody who, anyone who's on this call who owned a restaurant during COVID knows all about that executive order allowed for a significant amount of alcohol to go. Then that executive order, this is where people started to lose track of the history a little bit. That executive order then, uh, expired. And there was no alcohol to go again. And then we got a law passed in Albany. And that was what was passed in 2022. And that's what's currently in effect. And under that law, as I said, beer is already, you already could sell beer to go. You can still sell beer to go. So this law applies to wine and liquor only. Under the law, you as a restaurant on premises license can sell alcohol to go if it's wine or liquor. To go means for delivery. Um, it can, it, or it means takeout, um, as long as number one, it's a, a single serving size amount of, of liquor or wine. So no full bottles. You can't, like you saw during COVID, some restaurants turned themselves into half liquor stores where they were selling full bottles of wine or full bottles of spirits. That is not allowed under the current law. It has to be a serving size. And so that means like it could be a small ready to drink cocktail, like one of those small containers, you know, the can size. Um, it could be a glass of wine that's poured in a to-go cup. It could be a glass of a cocktail that's in a to-go cup. Um, it, oh, that's number one. Number two is that it has to be with food. Um, and it has to be uh, a food item that's of, along the lines of soup, salad, sandwich, or something of similar substance. So no, uh, no Cuomo chips, as they were called for a while. Um, it has to be a, a, a food item that you sell with it. That's important. And this is important to us as an industry, speaking on an industry level, because this is not an unlimited law. This law has a sunset provision. It's a three-year trial. We're one year in. There's two years to go. And um, we we call a lot of flack from the liquor store industry, you know, that were that, you know, who were very vocal in in being against this law. They said that this was going to help, this was going to undermine their businesses. We never thought it would. But, you know, all eyes are on us and our compliance as an industry with this law. And so it's important that we are complying with this law and we don't have stores that are selling full bottles of wine and liquor, which is not allowed. Because when it comes time to renew this law again, one of the things that we're going to have to lean on is that there was widespread uh, compliance and all of the, you know, the parade of horribles that, that, that the opponents of the law were afraid of and predicting didn't come to pass. Um, one last thing on alcohol to go, because we get this question frequently, especially as it relates to cocktails to go. Just because um, you are allowed to sell cocktails to go doesn't mean that you're allowed to pre-batch cocktails, um, which is still illegal unless you have it in a machine that continuously mixes the cocktail and is, has a capacity of a gallon or more. Uh, and so that's like the, uh, the, the cocktails on tap. So if you don't have that, or even if you do and you're not using it, what you can't do is you can't pre-batch, let's use uh, sangria as an example. You can't pre-batch the sangria the night before. You can't you know, pre-batch 200 little bottles of sangria and have them all ready to go or your, or your house cocktail. They have to be made per order. Um, and we do see people getting violations with that. So it's important to raise. Um, that's alcohol to go. Uh, Rob, anything you want to add to that? No, that's good. Okay. I do see there are some questions on that. We'll circle back to that in the, in the Q and A. Um, Next topic and 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 uh, and last topic on the state liquor authority and alcohol, which is corporate changes. Uh, sorry, last topic on 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 legislation. Now, there are some other topics on the SLA that we're going to talk about next, but uh, last legislative topic is corporate changes. So one of the things that the governor has proposed, and we think it's a really great idea, and we fully support it. Um, is to improve the way in which the New York State Liquor Authority handles corporate change applications. Just to remind folks on the call, when you apply for a liquor license, one of the things that you're required to do is submit an ownership structure of who all the individuals are who, are, uh, who have a, a qualifying interest in the business uh, that's going to hold the liquor license. And in New York State, 
our law says that you can't change those individuals until you get pre-approval from the state liquor authority to do so. And the way you get that pre-approval is by filing and getting approval of a corporate change application. So there's, there's a transaction, a partner is coming, a partner is going, there's a change taking place. You need to file a corporate change application. Going back to today's theme, the time that it's taking for the liquor authority to process corporate change applications is making it really difficult for, for people to comply with this law. It was easy to comply when it took 30 to 60 days to file and get approval of a corporate change application. But when it's taking upwards of eight months, most transactions are not going to wait eight months before they get consummated uh, while, while a regulatory approval happens. And so um, what the governor has proposed, which we think you know really helps tackle that issue, is putting a 90-day outside date, essentially, on corporate change applications. And so the way it would function is you still have to file a corporate change application before any changes take place. But if the state liquor authority does not act on that corporate change application within 90 days of filing, then the application would be deemed approved. And the only circumstance in which the liquor authority would be able to, after the 90 days, rescind the approval is if one of the people that's being brought on is disqualified by statute from having a liquor license. So, you know, for example, if someone is, um, you know, under 21, they're not allowed to have a liquor license. So if even if the 90 days passed and they were deemed approved, if the liquor authority figures it out later, they could rescind the approval. But with that small, you know, you know, you know, wrinkle aside, you know, it's great because it provides an important outside date. It will provide predictability for parties that are looking to enter into these transactions that's for them to know that at the end of 90 days, they can close their transaction if they haven't heard from the SLA otherwise. So um, we think it's great. And um, it's not it's not something that we uh, have seen in any of the assembly or Senate uh, materials yet. But as Rob said, um, it's you know there's still plenty of time to go in the legislative session. Rob, anything you want to add on corporate changes? No. Uh, you want to handle a few alcohol to go questions now before we move on? Sure. Let's do it. So, um, so yeah. can a restaurant wine licensee sell draft beer to go as opposed to sealed bottles, assuming it's it's sealed with a lid in a cup? And does a single pour of wine also need to be sealed when sold to go? Sure. So I could take both of those questions. Right. And so first of all, restaurant wine the answer to this is true no matter what type of on-premises license you have, whether it's restaurant wine, tavern wine, full on-premises, all of those license categories have the privilege of selling beer. Um, and beer to go can be draft beer as long as it's sealed. So you can pour draft beer directly into a to-go cup. You can pour it into a growler. You can pour it into whatever you like as long as it's per order. You're not doing it in advance of the sale and it's it's sealed. Um, and as far as wine is concerned, yes. And that's actually, you know, it's supposed to do the, the right way to do it. If, if some, you know, you're not allowed to sell a full bottle of wine. If you, if someone wants wine to go, uh, either for delivery or for takeout, all they, all you have to do is, is pour that into a to-go glass sealed. Um, and then you're covered. There's also a question about, is there a quantity limit on, you know, how many glasses of wine you could sell with an order, um, or, or, or these the split bottles, the small bottles. So there's not a quantity limit. Um, you know, we think, you know, we have a very creative industry, but we also want people <laughs> to be reasonable. And, you know, so, you know, the the primary thing that you should be thinking about other than just, you know, talk to a lawyer, that's always good advice. But, you know, putting that aside is, you know, you don't want to be seen to be undermining the purpose of this law. The purpose of this law was not for you to become a liquor store. And if, the, and if too much of that happens, then as I say, um, you know, that puts us in a tough position when we want to get this law extended. So, for example, somebody's ordering a hamburger to go and they wanted a bottle of wine. You tell them, I'm sorry, I can't sell you a bottle of wine um, to pour that bottle into five, you know, to go cups with this with the hamburger. I would say, you know, would not meet the spirit of the law. And you should think of that in the back of your mind each time you have a question you know, concerning something like that, if, you know, if something in your stomach lights up that this is a question, then you probably should, should take it slow. Assume that any one of those situations is an undercover SLA inspector. That's, that was always how I advise people. And if it was an undercover inspector, do you feel you could justify what you just did? Same thing with substantial food item is a question. You know, it's not a game. 
you know, you know, it has to be a substantial food item. A potato chip, substantial food item, no. Is a roll, substantial food item, no. Is a sandwich, yes. Is a hot dog, yes. Um, you, that's that's the amount of guidance that's been used, for the, been given. You know, for the most part, soups, salads, sandwiches, um, things of that nature, is a substantial food item. All right, we're now. Uh, past the half hour mark, yeah. well, so we're going to keep moving. Um, I, I, Carlos, you asked a good question about um, temps. So I'm going to try to come back to that um, at the end. Um, all right, Rob, you're up. Quickly, how should a corporate change application? Oh, and I'm sorry, and, and I'm sorry, Rob. Oh, sorry. Were you talking about corporate changes some more? Were you going to add one? One, one quick question. Okay, one. How should a corporate change? Qu corporate change question. This is an important one. How should a corporate change be addressed that has already happened? Uh, and that is quickly. Uh, generally, the liquor authority uh, in this policy, in its unstated policy, and our decades of practice before them, has kind of always taken the position that if we go to them before they come to you, um, we're going to be able to work it out. You know, if, you know, if it's a substantial corporate change that took place, there might be a fine associated with it. But if you go to them first, then you know we, we're going to we're going to be able to work it out. If they come to you because they've discovered this corporate change that was never filed. Um, and God forbid, the individuals that were brought on are not eligible to be licensed. Well, then you've got a problem. So faster the better is the answer to that question. Um, all right. So now we're going to switch gears and still on the topic of alcohol, but we're going to talk about moving away from legislative changes to some policy changes within the State Liquor Authority itself that um, are recent and, and mostly positive and, and worth noting. And Rob's going to talk about the first few. Yeah, I'll try to go through this quickly because I know there's a lot of people want to talk about cannabis. Um, so I mentioned you know, in the introduction that the Liquor Authority is doing what it can do with the number of people that it has to try to address this backlog. Why is there a backlog? I, I guess I, I should have said that before. There are considerably more applications than there ever have been. People are doing what they're supposed to. They're filing corporate changes. They're filing all this, the quote, minor applications they've never filed before. There's a lot of activity because of all those closed, thousands of closed stores, you know, throughout the state with new people coming into them. Those are all new applications, which take a lot more time than a simple renewal had, you know, COVID never happened. Plus, you know, the, the, the size, uh, the staff size of the liquor authority is a shade of what it was when I started working with them over 30 years ago. So they bring in more money than ever before, and they have fewer people than ever before. So they're doing what they can do. One of the things they've done is they've issued a series of advisories, um, which basically say, this is what we're going, this is how we're viewing the law. And those advisories have reduced the amount of paperwork that we need to submit now with an application. It doesn't change the law. It doesn't reduce the requirements. It just re reduces your need to submit at time of application. And therefore, you can get your application in faster, a weekend representing you. And their, their analysts could review the application faster because there's less documents for them to review. So for example, um, we no longer have to submit the certificate of occupancy showing that you have the right to use the premises for a restaurant, bar, hotel, whatever you've applied for. We don't no longer have to submit bank statements, three consecutive months bank statements showing where your money's coming from. That doesn't mean that you don't have to have source of funds. And that doesn't mean that they're not eligible, that they have not reserved the right to ask for them if, if they so choose. So if you're working with, you know, with an attorney, I know our practice is to still ask you for that so that we have it and we know that if they ask for it, it'll meet the requirements that they want and it won't hold up your application while, while it's being pending. Same thing for the certificate of occupancy. Um, you shouldn't, if the building doesn't have appropriate CFO for what you're doing, you should speak to an architect to find out, am I going to be able to get this? Because if you can't, you might be able to get a license now, but if it's a gas station or if it's a residential apartment in a residential building, you might be able to get the license because you don't have to give the C of O. But as soon as they find out about it from the community board or a complaint, they have the right to ask for it. Or as soon as the municipality issues you a violation for operating contrary to the zoning or land use, you're going to lose your liquor license. So do not use that as a, it's not a get out of jail free card, quite, quite the opposite. Um, also, a very significant one is the new 10% rule. Historically, everybody, no matter how de minimis their ownership, had to be disclosed to the liquor authority. And in many cases, also, if there were fewer than 10 owners, 11 owners, they had to fill out paperwork, get fingerprinted, uh, do a variety, you know, 
personal questionnaire, et cetera. Now they said if you have under 10%, if you have a, an individual or individuals that have under 10% ownership, we don't have to disclose them anymore. We don't have to submit paperwork for them anymore. They don't have to get fingerprinted anymore. That's a, you know, that puts them in line with federal TTB you know, requirements and many other states. And, that's, and that is a, you know, a big reduction. Having said that, everybody who, who, no matter how small their ownership percentage is, even if they don't have to be disclosed, still have to meet all the statutory requirements to be licensed. And there are standard statutory disqualifications. For example, you cannot be a convicted felon unless you have a certificate of relief from civil disabilities. You have to be 21 years or over. You can't be a law, current law enforcement officer. You can't have had a license revoked previously. You can't own any part of a business which distributes alcohol or produces alcohol. You know, no 2% owner in some you know, boutique winery in Long Island or upstate or a, or a distillery and be on a restaurant. So those statutory disqualifications still hold, even if you don't have to disclose to those people. So due diligence still has to be done between you and your attorney filing the application to make sure that there are no disqualifications from the small percentage owners. And there's other smaller aspects of streamlining as well, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time covering because I want to move to cannabis. But there, there's what we've covered are the main ones, some other noteworthy ones. These are more you know unique scenarios, but they may apply to you. Um, if you currently are paying the liquor authority every few years for a warehouse permit in your basement to store alcohol, because the only way to access your restaurant's basement is by going out onto the sidewalk and then down through the sidewalk hatch to get there historically, that couldn't be included as part of your liquor license because it's not contiguous. They've done an advisory doing away with that, creating an easier, more streamlined process, which reduces the burden on you to, of having to renew a warehouse permit. Um, instead, you just have to add it to your license once and be done. And so, you know, you, know, you should look into that if that applies to you. They've also streamlined the fingerprints process. Um, if you have investors who do need to be fingerprinted, but for whatever reason, there's a lot of problems with their fingerprints. They've gone a few times and their fingerprints don't read. If the sometimes this happens with, with people who are who are older and their fingerprints get they are smooth, their fingertips are smooth and it's hard to read. Um, they've now have a process where they could fill out an affidavit and say they have no criminal background instead of uh you know, and this is where we want to compliment both yeah. the chairman, you know, Vincent Bradley and the deputy commissioner for licensing, Tom Donahue, who while he's only been in the current position for a year and a half, he's been with the agency. You know, I think is lo lo longer than I've been, you know, appearing before there um, as an attorney, you know, in the agency, is, they really are looking to do whatever they can to streamline the process. And these advisories were, were a really good step in that direction. You know, we appreciate that. Let's jump into cannabis. Yeah, go ahead. Brief introduction, Dennis. It's all yours, Max. Um, we did a webinar uh, two years ago in April 2021 about the, co the coming of the cannabis law, how it's going to be structured like you know, the alcohol law, et cetera. We never, thought we're, we never thought that two years later we would be where we are now. Um, the, pro the rollout has been slow. It's played with delays. In many ways, it's a disaster. Uh, lawsuits continue to pile up. Uh, there are many aspects of the program that have been threatened. Um, the proliferation of unlicensed brick and mortar dispensaries, as many as 1,300 of them, nobody predicted um, and was quite frankly ignored by the Cannabis Control Commission uh, until recently. Uh, and now uh, the governor has proposed what should have been from day one, is that is uh, you, you know, a law hopefully will get passed in June that giving them power to shut down unlicensed premises. If you open an a liquor store or a restaurant with a full bar without a liquor license, you'd be shut down within 24 hours. Um, the same has to be if you're going to have a lawful cannabis system. You can't have an illegal marketplace literally side by side with a legal marketplace. So we are where we are. Max is going to explain for all of you who are still interested in applying for licenses, um, you know, what that means and when you can expect to file an application. Yeah. And, you know, we want, there's been a lot of people who've been contributing to the conversation about cannabis. Uh, you know, we want to contribute to it from the perspective of the hospitality industry, because there's always been interest. And we've been aware of that from, from before day one. And we continue on, you know, every day to hear interest about people who are likely on this call, people who are in the bar industry, the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry, people who, who deal with the state liquor authority on a regular basis they have questions, they're curious about getting into the industry. And so we want, you know, so our approach has always been through that lens. And 
because of the, uh, we mentioned this two years ago, and it really has played out, um, given even though there's been not as much progress as we thought um, in the progress that there has been, you know, in terms of the regs that have been issued, it has played out. There is a, um, the, the DNA of New York's cannabis laws and regulations is in our alcohol regulatory system, as is the case in other states. And so we do have a, a built-in expertise in the cannabis licensing side given our expertise in the alcohol alcohol licensing and our fluency in many of the issues that have um that have transferred over so the current state of play for those in the hospitality industry who want to know about the cannabis uh licensing rollout is that th there have been zero permanent licenses that have been issued to date everything that the Office of Cannabis Management, which is controlled by its Cannabis Control Board. So you'll hear me using the, the, the word, the acronym CCB or OCM. Those are just interchangeable for, for most of this discussion, just means New York's cannabis uh, regulators. Um, uh, up until now, all that they have done is they have issued conditional licenses. Conditional licenses are basically you know, non-permanent licenses that are supposed to be only for the initial you know, stand up period of the program. So they've, been, they've issued conditional cultivator and processing licenses, and that's for people to cultivate and process cannabis. But they've only issued those. The only categories of people eligible for those have been existing hemp farmers and growers. There's also the existing medical industry, which we'll, we'll put aside for a minute. Um, and, you know, so there are several of those upstate that have obtained conditional licenses and they grew cannabis all throughout last season and uh, many of them are making decisions now about whether to continue under under that license to grow cannabis this season um and then there's the retailers right now the state has issued five conditional retail licenses and that's also not uh, you know not everybody is eligible there was an application window for those the only people who were eligible were people who met the justice involved criteria that meant that they had to have qualifying criminal uh, backgrounds. Um, there's there's more detail to it than that, but it, in some ways it doesn't matter because um, if you applied, great. If you didn't apply and you felt you were eligible, it doesn't matter because it's too late because that window is now closed. And so um, there is no window currently to apply for any sort of license, much less uh, a permanent license. Um, of the five legal dispensaries that are in New York State, three of them are in New York City, and they hope to continue to open more. There was there were several hundred applications that were submitted while the window was open for retail licenses for the justice involved applicants, and they are working, as we're told, to uh, process those applications and approve more of them. So we do expect to see more come online. There have been some um, pretty frustrating bureaucratic delays with getting with getting those licenses online um and so you know, you know nobody knows with any sort of credibility how quickly that's going to happen but more are coming online um i think they had over a thousand of those applications they approved reserved 150 right, that's right we announced yeah. that doubling that to 300 yeah. um but getting those stores opened is uh, is a challenge for them and it's just not clear how many they want to see open before they even start accepting applications from the rest of the world. Right. So for the non-justice involved applicants, they have drafted regulations and those regulations don't cover all of the license categories, but they do cover some of the main license categories like uh, dispensaries. Um, those regulations mostly track the cannabis law that was passed uh, that, that started all of this, although there are some uh, concerning aspects to the regulations. One of them is a 1,000 foot rule in New York City uh, and other cities of significant population, which would appear to um, limit the ability to have multiple licenses within 1,000 feet of each other. That's particularly concerning given the density of New York City um, and that they're going to be having the justice involved applicants uh, be licensed first. It's not clear how, you know, where there will be room for non-justice involved applicants when the time comes. Um, but that's really as far as they've gotten is they've, for the non-justice involved applicants, they've drafted regulations and that's it. So that's the current state of play as it relates to applications, you know, currently. What I want to talk about next from a hospitality perspective is looking beyond dispensaries and, and focus back in on the other types of licenses that are out there. 
um, and where things stand with those. Although the theme of the day returns again on this topic, which is you know slow and 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 things not moving fast enough. Um, the main type of license that a lot of folks in our industry are interested in, which is the on-site consumption license, um, there really has not been much regulatory activity involved in that at all. An on-site consumption license was a unique um, innovation. Uh, that other states have, but not many other states have it, um, that New York had when we passed our cannabis law, which allows for on-premises consumption of cannabis products, which on its face um, seems really great. Um, like I said, we get a lot of calls and interest about those licenses all the time. It remains the least developed category. So of all the regulations they've done so far, they haven't done any substantive regulation fleshing out the requirements of that license, sort of what's okay, what's not okay, whether food's allowed, whether it's not allowed, what type of outdoor space is permitted. None of that has been covered in the regulations that they've done to date. There, none of the conditional licenses cover the on-site category. So the conditional licenses, like I said, are, are processors and cultivators and, and dispensaries, but not the on-site license. Um, and so, you know, we're really eager to learn more about that, but in a lot of ways, we, you know, we're not much better off with that license category than we were two years ago when the, when we did our last webinar. And, you know, that is news in and of itself. And that's worth everybody noting because there's a lot of talk about there and a lot of rumor and half truths about what's going to happen. You know, I, you know I, I hear rumors frequently. Oh, I've heard this is going to happen. All we know is what has happened and what has happened on the on-site license category is not much. I want to repeat one, came a couple of questions. I want to repeat something from two years ago. It has not changed. Can it, in our state, as in many other states, cannabis and alcohol will not mix in the same location. If you have a, if you're licensed by the state liquor authority, you will not be allowed to have cannabis or cannabis infused products or cooking with cannabis at, at all. Yeah, and that's something, by the way, that we had pushed for there not to be. I mean, we wanted, you know, on-site licenses to be able to be on the same premises as liquor licenses, but we were basically told not so fast. And, and that's where things remain. The one exception to that, and I do want to raise that, is um, CBD. So under both the liquor law and under the cannabis law, you can sell CBD if you, CBD products, if you have, even if you have a liquor license, you can't mix uh, the CBD product with liquor. So you can't make CBD and liquor cocktails. Um, you have to get a CBD retail license from the Office of Cannabis Management, which many of our clients have done. And we're aware of many people who haven't done it. And you should because um, you know, those, those licenses are available. They're from the Office of Cannabis Management and it lets it makes it legal for you to sell CBD products. Um, you, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to purchase CBD products from legitimate um, uh, sources, whether they're manufacturers or distributors of CBD products, and sell them in your premises. You're not mixing the CBD. You're not creating the CD, CBD product yourself. And as I've said, you're not mixing it with alcohol. You're so, not even mixing it with, with, with non-alcohol. You're not allowed. You can't buy CBD, mix it, and create your own food. You, you could right. buy a CBD-approved uh, soft drink. Um, if you have that license and you're buying it from a licensed producer or, host, or wholesaler. Yeah. Um, another license category I want to touch on quickly, I'm, I'm mindful of the time and we want to be able to answer some more of the questions, um, is the micro business license category. That's another category that's not a, a dispensary category. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in our industry about it. The recent regulations that they've put forth actually do unlike for the on-site licenses where the regulations are pretty quiet, um, the, uh, the, the micro-business category, the regulations that they put forth do give us some indication of what that's going to be about. And it allow, what it's going to do is it's going to allow for cultivation of cannabis plus one of the following additional activities, processing, distribution, or retail. So for those in the hospitality industry, a, a decent, although imperfect analogy is the farm license category that you can get where if you are a farm manufacturer of alcoholic beverages, you have some additional retail privileges. It's a similar idea where you're going to be capped 
Um, you're not going to be allowed to produce cannabis at sort of, you know, um, at, at significant scale. So you'll be capped, but it will, it will allow you to have what probably everybody's going to go for is for the retail uh, privilege so that you could have some vertical integration. Um, but just like the on-site licenses and every other type of license, you can't apply for that right now. We're still waiting for, you know, when we could apply for it. So, you know, wrapping up on cannabis, you know, I just want to spend a minute talking about enforcement of unlicensed activity. And, you know, before, I mean, everybody knows about what's going on with that. And so before I, I, I say what I want to say about that, I just want to mention, you know, we, we get, a, there's a lot of anxious people who call us to say, you know, look, I want to, I, I don't qualify as justice involved, but I want to get my foot in the door. I, you know, I, I, I want to, uh, you know, be, you know, be here, you know, early on in the industry. And look, there's lots to keep up to speed on. There's, there's, there's developments happening all the time. Um, you know, we've covered some of them today. So there's definitely a lot to be kept up to speed on, but, you know, not, now is not necessarily the time to, you know, sign a lease that is, you know, that has no contingencies and where you're going to have to start paying rent soon, because there's still, as you can see, a lot of unanswered questions in terms of what's allowed and what's not allowed and when it's going to be allowed. And so if, you know, you're locking yourself into a lease where you have to start paying rent soon, you know, especially if there's no contingency, you know, for, and because you want to open a dispensary, um, you know, I would hold off on that um, for now. Um, Rob, you want to say anything about unlicensed activity? Yeah, somebody asked about, uh, yeah, <laughs> other than what I said before, they have to close down all these places uh, that are selling unlawfully. No, uh, I don't want to, nothing more than I want to say about that. Somebody asked a creative question. I love this industry. You know, BYOB, bring your own buds. You know, uh, I, given that there is going to be a separate license for consumption and that you cannot, you know, uh, consume at a liquor license establishment, I'm sure the regulations are going to make it very clear that. You can't allow your customers to come into a liquor license establishment, bring their own joints or bring their own cannabis, mix their own tea, smoke a joint, you know. Uh. Well, it, it's already not allowed just under the alcohol law. The alcohol law was, was you know, still says that you can't suffer or permit people to consume cannabis on a premises that has a liquor license. And so if you have a liquor license, you can't do bring your own cannabis. Um, and if, you, if you're one of the folks on this call who does not have a liquor license for your premises, Although there is a provision under New York's Smoke-Free Air Act, which allows for some limited tobacco smoking in, certain, in, a, in a limited outdoor area, the health department recently changed their regulations on that to, to make clear that you can't have cannabis smoking, even if you can have tobacco smoking in your outdoor area. So really, the regulatory authorities have clamped down on that, on the idea of bringing your own cannabis, and um, you know, we wouldn't recommend it. And before we get the question, let me answer it. If you, down the road, you get a consumption lounge uh, license or dispensary license, could you allow people to bring alcohol and have a beer while they're shopping? The answer is no. BYOB is not legal in the state of New York unless you have an alcohol license. And since you're not going to be able to get an alcohol license as a dispensary, there's no BYOB uh, you know, in, in, in the buds area either. So look, we're going to we're going to spend a few more minutes on we're going to, you know, we started a little late and there's some questions. And so, you know, we'll, we'll stay on a little after the, the hour mark to answer as many questions as we can. And so you are welcome to stay on as well. If you do have to leave now, I do hope you enjoyed this and found it informative. If you have follow up questions, we're, of course, happy to speak with you. It's easy to follow, find us online. You could also just look at our website. It's pb.law. Um, we'll do a few questions that people have yeah. put into the Q&A. Uh, yeah. I think we answered this one already. Uh, what are the rules around cannabis infused foods at a restaurant menu? The, the rules are you can't do it. It's not allowed. Yeah. And there's a lot of you know questions going around about that. And we understand that there is still somewhat of a Wild West atmosphere with what's going on with cannabis and, you know, and, and the lack of enforcement. And, you know, enforcement is coming um, slower than it should have, but it has. But for anyone who has a liquor license, I mean, the enforcement aspect is already there. You should not be having cannabis on your premises for any reason if you have a liquor license. It's illegal and it's not going to be legal for any, you know, for any time soon. Um, Carlos Carvajal, if he's still on, um, he asked a question a while back that I want to answer, going back to the subject of temporary permits. And it's a good question. And it's a question that we get frequently. And we have a strategy that we, we often employ that 
um, you know, it, it helps certain types of people. And the question is, can you apply for a temporary beer and wine license while waiting for your full liquor license? And of course, the reason that's a good question is because as you heard me say, you're eligible, if you're applying for a beer and wine license, you're eligible for a temp basically as of right. Whereas if you're applying for a full liquor license and it's a 500 foot case, there's all these limitations and you may not in fact be eligible. So the answer to the question is no. A, the temp that you apply for has to match the type of permanent license you've applied for. So you can't mix and match. You can't apply for a permanent full liquor license and then you know not be eligible for a, a temp and somehow fix that by saying, oh, I'll just have a, a temp for beer and wine. But what we do see some people do, and it depends on your business model and how much time you have is, and we advise our clients on this, is that you could apply for a permanent beer and wine license. That will get you your temp. You operate under the beer and wine temp. And once you have your permanent beer and wine license, roughly seven to eight months after you file for it, at that point, you could apply to change the class of the beer and wine license to a full liquor license. That takes its own time. You would be eligible for a temp, a full liquor temp at that point in time. So it doesn't work for everybody, but you know, but it does work for certain businesses who say to themselves, look, I think it's more important for me to open with some type of booze rather than no booze. And so I and I'm opening soon. So I'm and I'm not and I, you know, I'm going to open much sooner than eight months from now. So I'm willing to open and for a while just sell beer and wine, probably about a year when it's all said and done, just sell beer and wine just so I could have something and then later on upgrade to full liquor. Obviously, if you're opening, you know, a bar, that's not necessarily possible, depends right, right. on your business model. But we have clients, you know, whether it's pizzerias, Italian food, wine bars, you know. 80% yeah, of the food. alcohol they're going to sell, 80% of the alcohol they're going to sell is beer and wine anyway, right? So, uh, Carlos, I hope that answers your question. Go ahead, Rob. A couple of questions. Let, let me go back to some confusion about CBD. Um, so uh, interesting, per anonymous attendee. Uh, let me answer your question. Um, apparently, there's a, a number of people with the same name, Max, so on the, their <laughs> anonymous attendee. Um, yes, you are correct. There was a, for a period of time, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene said no CBD products on your licensed health department premise. But when the cannabis law came in and the Office of Cannabis Management came in, simultaneously, a CBD law was passed. And that CBD law created a, a licensing system for CBD products. Um, and, and where that stands right now is there is a licensed manufacturer for CBD, there's a licensed wholesaler, and there's a licensed retailer. So you could get a license, a retailer's license to sell CBD products that you buy from licensed wholesalers and manufacturers. These are already pre-packaged products that have CBD in it. That is that is now allowed. You're still not allowed to create your own CBD menus by buying liquid CBD, mixing it and, and creating it itself. That you're not allowed to do. All right, let's see. We have a question from Sandra. Are the rules, we'll do maybe one or two, if anyone has any others, we'll do maybe one or two before we uh, sign off. Are the rules for temporary permits only pertain to permits that are subject to the 500 foot law? I was under the impression that these rules were for all temporary permits. Now, the rules that I've summarized today that we got passed under the, under the new temp bill, which is now in place, apply to all types of liquor license applications. Remember, and the, this is the better way to think about it, temporary permits don't exist on their own. So, it's, you know, so don't think of a temporary permit as you know a beer and wine temp. Or a full pop up. Temp. You know, we're going to get or, a temporary right. for a pop up. No right. such thing. Or, or a temp subject to the 500 foot law. Every temp is tethered to the application for the permanent license that it's associated with. And so, if the application for a permanent license is not subject to the 500 foot law, which means that it's beer and wine, which is not, which is never subject to the 500 foot law, or it's full liquor, and it's in one of the rare places in New York City that's that doesn't already have three or more full liquor licenses within 500 feet, then the consequences of that is that 
you get what we call a quick temp, which right now is coming about three to four weeks after you file with the SLA. If it is subject to the yeah, five the community board, so right. add 30 plus days for the community board plus that approximately 30 days for the temp. If it is subject to the 500 foot law, then you might be able to get a temp or you might not. It depends on if the premises has been licensed in the past two years and didn't have that license canceled. If the premises has been licensed in the past two years, let's say the tenant just went out of business you know, five months ago, then you're still eligible for a temp. It's just going to be limited and it's going to take longer. What we've proposed and what we'd like to see happen in Albany is we'd like to make these restrictions, which are which in effect are practically only applicable to New York City, loosen these restrictions to help improve on a very successful program that and make New York City have more parity with the rest of the state where these restrictions really aren't in effect. So that's why we want to get rid of that two year look back period. So if a place that's never been licensed, and it's a 500 foot case full liquor, it should still be able to get a temp, and we shouldn't have to wait for a 500 foot hearing. Right, right. Um, I think we pretty much got the Q and A questions. Back. Yeah, last call. Last call for Q and A. Anything else before we go? Uh, a couple of thank yous. A couple <laughs> of very informative sessions. <laughs> we like those too, by the way. We like to know that we're communicating. Uh, you see us, we don't really see you. <laughs> um, all right. Um, well, with that, we just want to thank you all again. We want to thank the Hospitality Alliance, which. Um, of course, we're integrally, inv integrally involved in as general and legislative counsel. We want to thank the Alliance for putting this together. We want to thank all of you for attending and asking such great questions and for continuing to be the backbone of New York's hospitality industry, which is remains an extremely important industry to our state and, of course, to our city. Um, you, can, yeah, you, can reach us on, you can reach us on our website, pb.law, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, have further conversations with you. Right. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for attending.